organization of residents of Princeton Borough and Township with diverse backgrounds, interests, and talents. Princeton Future has grown out of a concern that much of the planning and proposed development of the critical downtown spaces have been proceeding in an unconnected manner. The aim of Princeton Future is to assist the municipal authority to take a forward-looking and more comprehensive approach. Investigation and consultation undertaken by Princeton Future indicates that these objectives are achievable with good planning. More detailed studies and further involvement of all concerned parties are, however, clearly called for. You have a lot of restaurants. I'm Charlotte Bialik. I'm on the school board, which is irrelevant to my irrelevant to my comment now. I miss the hardware store. There is no pharmacy. There's no real sort of utility and uses store right now in the downtown area. You can go clothing shopping or or books, but you can't pick up batteries. <laughs> And I think we really do need to look a little bit more at the utilitarian side of the commercial aspect of downtown. For pharmacy, I mean, it gives people. Sorry. For there is for a pharmacy, pharmacy on Witherspoon. For pharmacy on Witherspoon. Yeah, all, uh, but we're talking about the downtown section near the yeah. university. You can buy batteries at the kiosk. Yeah. Here. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Hilton. Hi, I'm Nick Hilton. I'm, I'm, I'm interrupting you. I'm sorry. Hey, but you want help? <laughs> I doubt you want my help, but I have two things to say. Uh, one is that I'm, <clears throat> as a local merchant or a local retailer, um, this, may, this may not be the appropriate time to say it, but you asked, so. Um, it's sort of tangential to what this lady said that that um, if I were if I lived in Morristown or in Freehold or in Ewing, I, I don't see any reason why I would come to Princeton to shop. Unless I, you know, I, what I think is that there's a uh, there's a uh, sort of this whatever you call those formula stores, the national chain stores that are that are able to pay rent in Palmer Square in the Central Business District, that the rents are as high as they would be in malls, all those stores are already in all the malls. Consequently, the downtown Princeton area has no real character. If you went to Greenwich, Connecticut, or to towns of that nature, there's a reason to go downtown to shop because those towns have locally owned, unique, and unusual shops. I don't, Erkins went out of business because he, he lost 25% of his business the first year that Home Depot opened. Yeah, and he never got it back. At least that's what he told me. I don't know whether competition, you know, whether we're ever going to be able to brook the competition, but to have mall stores in the downtown seems to me kind of, you know, why would somebody come and put up with the congestion and the parking that's, you know, that's endemic to any downtown to shop at stores that they could go and park in a lot and walk to real easily. So that's a, that's a concern of mine that Princeton sort of does, Although it has the university, what it has in retailing is kind of squashed out. Stores like mine are kind of squashed out to the outside where the rents are lower, where we should be able to be, I think. So why do so many people come to town on Saturdays? Well, if, if they come to town, you should find, I've heard a lot that, that there's a lot of people walking around on, on Witherspoon Street and walking around on Nassau Street that don't shop there. But I, I, I could be wrong, it's just that anecdotal evidence and, and let me know if I'm wrong, I'll, then I'll stop having this idea, which would be great, because I need to I'd sleep. Like, I'd like to have a dollar in my pocket for everybody who comes in Princeton and doesn't buy a thing, because it's happening. Just like they go to a mall and walk around, don't buy a thing. And let's face it, you know, there's no nice way to say this. Princeton's uh, 20, 35% higher than anybody else. Why would you come here? <laughs> so why do here, here. For a lot of different reasons. Well, that's what I'm getting at. What are they? And what, what should we do in our planning? Well, well so you might come to sightsee. You'd be surprised that that takes place too. Right. Okay. We, we do have a few stores that draw people from out of town. Apparently one of them, the one of the big draws in Princeton, is the Princeton Record Exchange. People come from all over the East Coast 
to visit that store. And I would say that um, Macabre's Books is a happy exception to um, some of what's happening in the downtown. But I think um, uh, Ms. Gunning understood when I talked about changing the master plan earlier that there are communities that have changed their zoning ordinances to make it harder and harder for formula stores and formula restaurants to enter a downtown, and we could do that too. And I, I guess one of the things that I've been wondering is, uh, since the meeting started is why is this meeting being held under the auspices of Princeton Future? Why isn't it the planning board or the master plan subcommittee of the planning board that called this meeting? Um, I don't know that it's um, necessarily the case that, uh, well, let me, let me just leave it at that. <laughs> Any other comment, Bob? Bob Geddes, co-chair. Thank you for asking that question. Um, Princeton Future's purpose is to be a civic uh, participatory organization that tries to help the elected representative government be better. It's, that's all it does. It, it's a kind of what if organization. Uh, let's go back in history five years ago. There was a parking lot here um, and the issues of what that, or, that parking lot ought to be. The what if issues were discussed in meetings just like this. We weren't fortunate enough to have this room. We had to meet elsewhere. But this room came about as a result of those what if meetings. Uh, the idea of the square, the idea of the walkways, the idea of a parking garage woven into a downtown, but one which we didn't see all the time. In fact, uh, one that just became part of the, of the general fabric. All those ideas came up in what if meetings. And that's what this is. There is, I mean, it's a what if meeting, and there were, should be many of these. There is though, having said that, there's a fundamental structural difference between what would occur in the discussions five years ago and tonight. Tonight, we have to deal with the reality that we don't own the land. The, the government owned the land, and it was our land, really. We don't own the land. And we have to begin to think about what does that mean? What uh, procedures, what institutions, what kinds of, of, of pro pro what process could there be to influence the future when we don't own the land? I think people can hear me without the mic, is that correct? I think that we need some sort of a Princeton Development Board. I think that's a very good point that uh, Bob Geddes has made, that we don't own the land in this case. Uh, perhaps something, some, some sort of a development corporation, whether it's, it's civic or private, should be formed in order to buy the land. Um, this comment is structural about the meeting. It's, um, I come to downtown because it is pretty here. It is nice to walk here. There are cafes I can stop and have coffee, well, one in particular. Mm -hmm. There is the library. I cannot wait for the park. As soon as it is as warm again as it was yesterday, when there are benches and trees in the park, I will be sitting there. I stop in at the local stores because personally, and I don't think I'm in the minority in Princeton, I like small businesses and I can afford to go and, 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 and buy their services. And I think what is really unique about Princeton and why people do come here and why they are, ta and why they are tourists here is because it is a real town. Like in the old days, like we dream about when we go to malls and say, what the heck am I doing here? I should be in a real town. Princeton is fairly unique in central Jersey in that way. Most of the other towns are spread out all over the roads. And I think that in the central part, the parks, the benches, the trees, the small businesses, the cafes and restaurants, those kinds of things are in and of themselves a draw, and we need to 
appreciate that, I think there is an aesthetic component that is critical for our to pr for us to preserve. Can we improve them? I mean, in other words, Absolutely. what can we what could we suggest tonight in a what if session, uh, building on Bob's comment of what we might do to the downtown that is not necessarily the downtown of choice to go shop at a Gap, as Nick Hilton is saying, but a, a, a place to come to sightsee, uh, uh, like Mr. Craig is saying, then what is it that we would need to do, particularly to the southern part, that we can make part of our report? Or we can walk all the way up. I mean, uh, so I would open it to that kind of suggestion. Yeah. Go ahead, Sean. Yeah, um, I, I've started spending parts of my time in summer in Santa Barbara. I really think whoever here can do it should go to Santa Barbara <laughs> and look at the, this is Santa Barbara, California, look at the history of their town development. It's quite remarkable. It's largely due to one woman's efforts, believe it or not. And it is an incredible downtown that is in and of itself a park. And it has parades of any kind. And as far as I can tell, our museums do nothing in the town besides have their own space um, isolated from the street itself and from opportunities for the public to come in in large numbers uh, to really take advantage not only of the event that's happening in the street but all the businesses alongside <coughs> and, and, and everything else that's a qu a good quality. And we could take a look at what Santa Barbara does along those lines as well as what they've actually done in terms of city planning which is put all the parking off on the side. There is no parking on the central business district street. Uh, the sidewalks are quite wide with really excellent plantings and, and places to settle and, and sidewalk cafes, those kinds of things. So people really use the street. Now, of course, it's Santa Barbara. You which think they're going to take the meters out here, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, but that's a decision. That is a discussion because uh, I was also going to say I, I, they do a mixed thing. They do have the bigger businesses like the gaps and, and the small businesses. And it is a struggle for them in both ways. I'm sure the rents are very high. And I don't think they've considered any kind of subsidies of rents in the town, which I think we could uh, consider. I mean, I'm personally, and as part of the school board, very irritated and angry about the pilot process but, and, and fact. But, um, but I think that we could consider something for small businesses, which I think are a really crucial element of our central downtown business area. I have a I think it's Pam. I just want to, oh, I, sorry. Um, I just want to, uh, Charlotte brought out some good points that it is up to the residents more than it's up to zoning ordinances. And I, I would like to point out a couple of things that in the past few years, the small businesses have beaten the pants off of these horrible chains. I, I, where the gap was, we have an individually owned business owner store now. Where uh, Burger King is out of business. Um, Woolworths, sadly, is out of business. Uh, we have the restaurants, even though we have a subway, we have far more individually owned thriving restaurants in town, and I think it's up to us. I don't think that you can, you can't just zone away uh, large commercial businesses by virtue of the fact that we don't have large spaces, we're not going to get a Walmart or a Home Depot downtown, but I think Princeton has done remarkably well in uh, supporting the small businesses, and it's up to all of us to make a point to support it. Uh, you know, I could go on and on and on and name the, the, uh, the, the, um, it's not Foot Locker, what's it, athletes, uh, what's this? Is it, is it Foot Locker? Well, anyway, but the individually owned sneaker store and the running store is doing far better than the chain store. It's up to service, it's up to how they present themselves, and I think it's up to us to do a real job, it get, going back to what Charlotte was saying, it, it, it's, it's, it's really generating enthusiasm for what we have here. And um, I, I don't think you can zone 
uh, against chain stores. It's just not possible. Well, that's not really true, is it? Well, I mean, we want to have more than one discussion about design and about the large formula of stores. But I would like to, Nick Hilton maybe never finished his... Uh, <laughs> no, I did. Well, yeah, I did have a second comment. Actually, in Nantucket, you're not allowed to have... I mean, Ralph Lauren, in order to have a store in Nantucket, had to buy the building. So, I mean, it would be easy for him to buy a building here, too. But nevertheless, <laughs> <laughs> by City Hall. I came tonight because I want to know what's going to go on with Witherspoon Street, because with all the talk that we have about downtown and this plaza here and the library, it's very beautiful. Witherspoon Street is, forgive me for saying this if you live on it, not the greatest street, you know? I mean, today there were, across the street from my store, there was a whole huge pile of... Well, maybe not, but I'm here because this meeting was supposed to be about... Nassau Street, the greatest street. About Witherspoon. Witherspoon Street is a wonderful street. <laughs> I have a it's store there, street. and there was a bunch of garbage and and mattresses and stuff out for the. I mean, have this is one on, of the main. Have you ever been on Nassau Street down by Hoagie Haven? I guess the same thing happened. I have been, yes, yes, sir. I have been there. And let me say something. Uh, if if. Uh, the hospital site ends up in the, to the hands in the hands of the clutches of Princeton University. That's a sin, a crime, and it's obscene. Can I have some feedback on that? Why shouldn't that be residential? Why shouldn't that be residential? Hasn't the town fathers caved into Princeton University enough? This country will go broke before Princeton University does. I think there's a real misunderstanding of that. I think I have to respond to that because... <laughs> <laughs> in your tool hat. <laughs> um, well, first of all, it's not... It's very, very far from a foregone conclusion that the university would ever be there in the first place. And uh, it's been certainly printed that if, if for some reason we do end up with that land, it would be a fully tax-paying property and it would be residential. So I, I, it wouldn't be academic, it wouldn't be classrooms, it wouldn't be labs, it would be exactly what you were saying you wanted there. So the, um, the assumption that it would be something that wouldn't be uh, complementary to the neighborhood is just not an accurate assumption. It would be faculty, staff, and graduate housing fully on the tax rolls. Uh, no different from the rest of the neighborhood. Right. And, and our goal is, is here is to imagine what it might be if it were residential, and, and we're not going to decide, uh, and can't decide, the ownership of it, as, as Bob getting said, we don't own it. But we may be able to influence the process of what is, is going to happen there. Uh, I just want to go back to the uh, Mr. Hilton's comment and relate, d d don't go away there. Uh, that we did discuss uh, a summary, I don't know if you were here at the time, of what we had covered so far in our other meetings, at the beginning of this meeting, uh, which I think we could summarize almost summarily as saying that the residential component of the street was considered to be extremely valuable, while the commercial part of it was also considered to be valuable, that, that the mix should not change so that there was more commercial, that if anything there should be more residential. The same theory came out in our discussion about the use of the hospital site, that it should be primarily <coughs> residential, that, that Princeton would benefit in, in all our tables by a new residential community on that site. Uh, and, and even some of the, I think, imaginative mixed-use ideas that uh, have emerged in the planning uh, community over the last 25 years were seen as, as less interesting to this group than we, I think, may have imagined at the beginning. That a, a primarily residential neighborhood would be of most benefit to Princeton. That's what we've been getting at our meeting. Let me be, so, let me be perfectly blunt, okay? Sure. Let, let's uh, I'll mince words. Driving down Witherspoon Street for me, passing bodegas and places that where guys are hanging out and things that were converted from houses into funky restaurants and 
that kind of thing, does not seem to me to be an ideal way to enter one of New Jersey's premier communities. It seems to me, and that's one of the major, if I'm not mistaken, one of the major traffic flows in and out of Princeton. It just seems to me that the street is in need of some kind of zoning or some kind of cleaning up. And I wondered whether this body here was going to address those well, actually, issues. I've actually heard it said that people are afraid to walk that. down that street. We have covered that. I want to respond to that. Um, when I get a chance, I want to respond to your Nick. Yes, sir. Yeah, I want to respond to Nick. Uh, Meet Eric. Say your name. Eric. Yeah. My name is Eric Craig, and I live on Witherspoon Street. Now, you're a newcomer. You just got there, right? Three and a half years. Yeah, three and a half years. I was born, my family was born and raised in Princeton. I live on Witherspoon Street. I may not like all of the garbage on the street, but the borough or someone has to do something about making the laws work and making people understand that they don't put that sort of thing out. So I have a house on Witherspoon Street. You're, uh, you're, in, you're, just, you're interested in business, but we're interested in living there. You know, and as far as crime is concerned, do you know the two bank robberies, the attempted bank robberies on, are there any banks on Witherspoon Street where two people were killed? Do you know about the murder down uh, uh, Mercer Street that's never been solved? Or the murder up 206 that was never solved? Do you know about any of those things? It doesn't all happen on Witherspoon Street. It happens all over this town. I didn't say anything about what, the, one of the things that we've I said the way I it looks. People numbers. are afraid to walk down Witherspoon Street? No, I don't think that, that happens all over, those kinds of situations. Well, one of the things that we have that has emerged at our meeting in, in, in relationship to both speakers is that we have something right here that says enforce housing ordinance. So and I'm for enforcing residential areas on Witherspoon Street and no more retail sales down there. <laughs> Can we have other comments? Yeah. I would like to go around the room and get everybody who hasn't spoken. I'm Rather Holly than Burlington. we have a uh, arm wrestling match between the people living on Littlesburg Street. Isn't one of the problems um, that I think Nick is mentioning with the mattresses and, and people hanging out, isn't one of the problems that we don't have enough affordable housing in Princeton? And because of that, uh, Witherspoon Street and the little arteries leading off it have become the home of people who are here trying to make a living, sending money home back to their families, and they're living in very cramped quarters, whether we want to admit it or not. And they're a very valuable part of this society. I know I work with them in landscaping. We all need, we all need people to do the jobs that we aren't willing to do anymore. So that's, that's an issue that we have to address and perhaps <coughs> this area that- uh, well, well, that's why we yes, here. have to have diverse, that, affordable that housing. Coming out of our community recommendations would be that we would like to see this site used in part for diverse and affordable housing and a variety of housing types. Which obviously, if we think of Witherspoon Street, but it's not only Witherspoon Street, it's, 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 it's all neighborhoods. Eric is absolutely right. All over town, we do have similar conditions. It's not only here. So I think it would be an important suggestion, which mitigates against us being, say, turned over to a CCRC, which on one level seems like it's very simple. But on the other hand, many of the issues that go up and down this street, up and down Nassau Street, would not be addressed by that solution. So we're going to try to follow what we think are these initial set of kind of options, suggestions, for what is. Can you say what is CCRC? We have many people that do not tune in don't necessarily know. It's Continuing Care Retirement Community. Continuing Care Retirement Community. Uh, I think that, you know, we're being televised. This is Channel 30. These are local access people, uh, volunteers, Mike Whitman. And plus, uh, I watch that channel quite a bit, and I notice that a lot of things that come on where there's community participation, half of the time you don't know who's talking, and the other half of the time, uh, it seems like we're holding back. There's a lot of holding back about really what's on our mind, and I think it's good to, to air it, uh, particularly since we do have Channel 30. Uh, 
I've lived in this town for 35 years. My name is Yvonne Blyman. <coughs> My husband was the mayor in the Princeton Township at one time. And I've been here to enjoy this town a great deal. I go to the Witherspoon area a lot. Uh, I browse around in the stores. I walk up and down the street. I go to Forer Pharmacy. I like the fact that I know these people. Uh, my cleaning lady lives on Witherspoon Street and I visit her. Um, we talk, we, we have fun together. Uh, my granddaughter came to visit a few years ago. They live in Connecticut. And one day we were down um, at the hospital, uh, sitting out waiting and waiting. And uh, there were some other little folks sitting around on that cute bench in front of the hospital. And we decided that we would organize a duck duck goose game. And uh, every once in a while when she visits, she'll say, come on, Grandma, let's go downtown and organize duck duck goose. So I do think this town is made up of people, uh, how much you enjoy life here, how much you're willing to expose yourself, go up and meet people. Uh, I go to the Arts Council, and Neumann is a faculty member there. I'm in her class. Uh, I parked around the corner from the Arts Council. I went into Palooza Travel on Monday saying, I don't know this agency. Where do you, where, you know, who are you? And the lady who worked in the back came out, and she said, well, she owned it. And I introduced myself, and I said, um, you know, do you organize trips? Where to? She said, to Guatemala. I said, well, that'd be great. I'd like to know more about it. And, uh, and she was so suspicious of me, and she was a little frightened of me. And I said, well, I just want <coughs> to say hi. I walk by here all the time. And then we exchanged names and phone numbers. So I don't know, maybe we'll get together. But I think that it isn't, you know, development. I think it's people. And I think if we're friendly and we like each other and we do go to each other's businesses and we take the time to introduce ourselves. Um, I know Michael Floyd. I know a third of the people in this room. And I live here because of you, not because of what's being developed or isn't developed. And I did go into Ralph Lauren one day and asked if I could work there. And the woman almost fainted. I mean, she, you know what she told me? I said, well, what are the terms of your employment here? Would you hire someone of my age? And she just, you know, kept backing up, and I kept walking forward. And then she told me that it's a, uh, a system where there's a quota, and if I do not meet my quota, then uh, that will be deducted from my salary. And I almost fainted, really. And then she said, but that's what IBM does. And I said, well, gosh. I'm glad I don't work for I never did. But, you know, so what am I saying here? I think parks, chairs that can move around so when you do want to play duck duck goose you can eliminate those that don't, you know, fit and what have you. And, you know, not too dusty and a little cleaned up. And I really am very upset with the borough that they do not enforce the garbage rules and the can rules and, and the the cigarette butt rules, I just made up a great slogan, I think. It says, no if, ands, and buts. The earth is not your ashtray. And I put that up in front of TV 30. I don't know if it's going to work. But, you know, I think we have to just embrace each other first, and then the development will take care of itself. I want to say one other thing real quickly. Yes. Uh, when you're talking about the borough, Here. they hurried up and cleaned Nassau Street off to get to those meters. Yeah. <laughs> With the spoon street, the snow was piled, and if you had to park, an, an older lady or an older gentleman would not be able to put money in those meters, and they did not clean with the spoon street off so you could get to the meters. But they hurried up. They'll clean the meter off up Nassau Street before they'll let a store open. <laughs> Just one more comment. The day of the snowstorm, I was having my hair cut in the Burrell salon, and I, um, she did a great job, a whole new look, and I really love her work. But they asked, the, the police asked me to move my car because there's no parking. 
So I said I would be happy to move my car, and I did, and I parked in Mrs. Burrell's, um, you know, driveway. But at the end of the day, when that storm stopped, she could not get her car out of that driveway. It was piled so deeply. Now I think, I don't know who is plowing the roads, but if they don't realize that people live in those houses, and people do have to access their driveways and homes, I think we've got to communicate. We've got to communicate. The Borough Council is considering a snow removal ordinance. Maybe you should let them know your opinion yes. about that. Three right. feet wide you have to dig, and it has to be within 12 hours of the end of the snow. So worry about it. Well, let's try to get back to some of the planning issues, because I think there are a lot of the maintenance and, uh, ordinances that could be um, addressed that would benefit uh, Witherspoon Street as well as all of the other streets. I wanted to, um, if Nick Hilton was not here when we started, um, and you talked about the appearance of Witherspoon Street as it presents itself to the uh, outside world. I think what we established at the beginning of our meetings back in November is that the street is considered the community street. How it looks, works, and functions was felt to be more of the interest of the community, not necessarily as Nassau Street or Commerce Square might function in its presentation to uh, an outside market. And I know that may be a little hard to for a commercial establishment who you know wants to um, sell to anyone but one of the things in looking at um, the mobility map the um, gray arrows that on 206 Michael you could uh -oh. gesture <laughs> were intended to to direct much of that gateway traffic to along 206 to enter in to Princeton uh, at in order Paul that the other place. maps actually make sense. Right. You can't have all the traffic coming into town, into town. down that street. Right. Uh, so we hope to try to be able to get enough expertise on our on our behalf to do something perhaps that would allow it to happen down at that end. That very peculiar set of <coughs> circumstances down there that needs organization of some sort. Uh, so, that was so we have a, we study this area kind of a note to ourselves, uh, and from then on we try to be as calm as possible, so to speak. Is that where uh, this was actually changes names for your, what is that cross street? This is Valley Road. Valley Road. Okay, this is Valley Road. Valley Road. Valley Road. Yep, yep, that's what I'm saying. Then that's Mount Lucas. That's where Witherspoon becomes Mount Lucas. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Right. So it's conceptually, it's a different precept that we're working with here in terms of how this street would work, and that's to facilitate higher levels of pedestrian at safer levels, as well as uh, bicycle of the mm -hmm. student uh, ch children who are going to community park school. Uh, there are a lot of uses that um, need to have you know, a reduction, including the residential uses in, in uh, traffic that's more regional. That's now, just to comment on that a lot, part of the appearance would be improved, uh, as well as issues of accessibility to the community park school by children on the street. There are a lot of bus stops for school buses and buses along the street. The sidewalks and, and all the actual uh, infrastructure uh, are going to be redone. So we, we have tried to indicate zones and issues about what could happen. And, and did you say that the sidewalk, I'm sorry, that they are going to be done? Did you? That's a fact? The street's going to be repaved and the, and the sidewalks are going to be rebuilt? without going forward with that, which I think is really wonderful, so that if we do have suggestions, I mean, this, this little wiggle right here is meant to indicate that there are a series of issues because of, of the, the number of children living in this area, crossing the street at this point, the hospital traffic, 
all create a, a, a big mess right here now. So, so we hope to indicate certain pedestrian uh, crossing suggestions and so on and so forth. All of which, and including um, the kind of treatment that, that will follow in relationship to the sidewalks, the trees, uh, so that, that it looks decent. And, yeah, I'm gonna say, I really need to think of that. I don't know who's in here who does the landscaping, but uh, I don't want to continually be the devil's advocate, but when you put new sidewalks in and new streets, there are width between the curves and the sidewalks that vary from two foot to three foot to four foot. And ever since, whoever has been planting trees, the space between my sidewalk and curb is about like this, about two foot. And they will invariably plant a tree in there that will have the curve of about six feet. <laughs> and now before you know, I'm serious now, the sidewalk is going to rise. Nobody has, has defined what kind of tree, what its girth is, what its use for a shade tree is to put in this area. If you go down Witherspoon Street, and I'm not talking about the older trees before, but the tree that was put in front of my house was not so very long ago. It's a red oak. Well, thanks to Holly, actually, who has walked the street, we have started to actually create an accurate, an accurate representation of all the different changes that are going on up and down the street in relationship to that issue. I mean, there's some things that I never noticed, uh, for example, that came out of that more micro-scale investigation. Uh, when it's redone, it has to take account of all those variations. I mean, the parking in the borough is on a different side of the street than the parking in the township. So as a matter of fact, you actually, the, the road switches halfway down in a Monte Carlo chicane uh, <laughs> uh, so that who noticed that? So that even that issue uh, is substantive enough to uh, to think of investigation. Torben brought back some images that that were outside of Copenhagen of, of the more state of the art marking and and level changes that are existing now in an advanced European pedestrian bike automobile mixing uh, that had some interesting suggestions. So we do hope to make some sort of suggestion that would allow. Eric's concern uh, uh, of the red oak uh, not to be planted in, in, in front of houses that have a two-foot strip. Uh, we would actually appreciate suggestions about what you think are good ideas. Uh, on University Place, uh, there is now, uh, because of the high traffic, uh, a brick has been placed instead of the green. Up and down the street, in many cases, uh, there is asphalt in that strip. Some of the owners of the stores, for which we are going to make some great suggestions to, and businesses on the street, have asphalt front lawns. Mm -hmm. Speaking of uh, bad ideas. Uh, so that uh, <laughs> we're all involved in this together, as was said earlier. Uh, some of the people who are actually uh, uh, businesses uh, uh, have not, it seemed to me, stepped up to the plate in order to address the aesthetic issue of the street. Uh, so we are trying to map that in detail, and we hope that, some, that if, if anything really concrete, pardon the pun, comes out of our suggestion, it would be some way in which that becomes realistically uh, and aesthetically pleasing. Well, I think realistic is a very important aspect. If you look at uh, strips of green, they're beautiful. But A, people trample all over them, so there's no lawn there after a very short period of time. Look at the little gardens down Nassau Street that people use to throw cigarette butts in and stomp on. Uh, when we do snow plowing, we put down salt first, and then we plow uh, the snow onto the green, and that kills the plants. It's, it's, and then people drive vehicles over them. And I think we have to be realistic. I, I love, you know, sort of country villages with green pieces in them and so on, but it involves people. We've, we've all been saying this, it all involves people. If we don't behave properly, the place will look like hell. 
And we need to worry about the scale that we want, for instance. We don't want, so people at the hospital told us, a 13 or 14 story structure. Maybe we need to be sure that those things don't come. That is the planning board that can deal with those issues. You talk of uh, the, an articulated street with, with individual buildings, not long fronts. Maybe that's something, again, we need to preserve. The change in zoning type in going from the borough, which is residential, commercial, into uh, the township, which then is uh, essentially a business district, and every building is uh, potentially uh, usable as a business. I think these things need a lot of uh, talking about. And the one thing that you're doing that doesn't happen except maybe in the planning board, is getting people to worry about something that continues from one municipality into the other and trying to see it as a whole. It's part of Princeton. And, you know, we've turned down the opportunity for being Princeton at least twice in the 40 years that I've been here. But we need to think about it still as an entity and deal with it that way. I, I, we have about 10 minutes yes, left. I've taken two minutes. And uh, you can keep it like that. <laughs> um, what I know that we didn't get to, and I did want to have some discussion about, and there are those pockets that are of opportunity and potential change um, that are in the southern section of Witherspoon Street, right across the street from us, the Spriggs Corner, a, a surface parking lot currently rented by the borough for parking, but it's privately owned and has future development potential uh, as the owners would certainly be interested in doing that. And um, there is the PSEG substation, which has a diminishing value in life in terms we, of technology. We didn't earlier, you did? I'm sorry. I had to leave. We actually we didn't get any comment, comment, had to comment on this. Uh, about it. Right. Yeah, so would you like the presentation on the and, substation? And the substation, Ooh. we have a short presentation on that. Um, and then there's just one more slide before we go to the presentation, and that is what was referred to as sort of as a, a third area of redevelopment that was part of the downtown redevelopment of the borough and borough-owned properties that's um, behind this the community liquors and the um, Dome Alley Dome behind Alley. Landau. So in that pocket there, um, there is development potential. And it actually enters off of Witherspoon Street, which is a sliver property which is currently being used as parking. We want these things to be, you know, hashed out amongst the community. And it seems we, we get tied up on central area issues, I know. But We'll have to try to revisit them and find the time again. Um, if you have something that you'd like to say, I'd the, like to hear yeah, it. Yeah, the, the only thing I think we would have, yeah. and, uh, and then Matt has been raising his hand, uh, uh, open to uh, creative suggestions as we continue our, our planning. It, it did seem to me that what, one of the very interesting things that came out of this was that uh, although we do uh, 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 like the, the small store atmosphere, at the same time, uh, there is a mixture that is valuable to both the town and the region, I think. But that in either case, m many people, I remember talking to Mitch Forrest about this, and, 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 uh, and Logan Fox, that a lot of the people who just come to town really don't buy things, uh, that they're here to sightsee. But that may be something that we are uh, not really facing as a town. <coughs> And these pockets of unuse uh, or barbed wire enclaves that ex still exist downtown, like the, the utility site, uh, are really both a, mis a, a missed opportunity and uh, pushing the density of use onto the available other remaining land in ways that could be alleviated if we were able to use them. Uh, which is what's going to happen next? Uh, yeah, I mean, we have a minute. We'll have a video <laughs> here. Do we need this cap just uh, to summarize the session? Know, or it's going to take time to just. It's just eight slides. All right, this is uh, this is a presentation of a uh, substation uh, having a problem. We're going to.
magnify this and run it over again. Yeah, good. That's good. And uh, if you can magnify that picture there. We'll... Um, okay, we're going to run this over again because it, uh, so you can see it. Let me let me introduce what's what's happening here. Uh, my name's Arch Davis. I'm a resident of the borough. Uh, I trained in electrical engineering and uh, did work for a power company for a period of time, so I'm pretty familiar with the issues on power stations. That technology does not change as, as fast as uh, computer technology or some other things today, consumer electronics and all that. Um, there's some small changes that go along, but basically uh, geometry and physics determine um, a lot of what happens uh, in electrical work. Uh, this substation <coughs> has two feeds coming in at 26,000 volts. One comes in down Witherspoon Street, it, it goes underground just before it gets to uh, Robeson Place, goes underground, feeds into the station. The other feed comes down Washington Road in Van Dievender and goes around the corner underground. All that's, It's all buried in that um, and it goes out to Route 1 and picks up a 66,000 volt line, another a larger substation. So there are always two feeds in case you lose one of them, the town doesn't go without power. And then coming out of that are feeds at 13,000 volts and 4,000 volts. That then, uh, I don't know exactly how many there are there, it's a, a half a dozen to a dozen. And uh, those the substation, what it does, it converts that 26,000 volts down to 4,000 or uh, uh, 13,000. And, and then various feeds go both underground and uh, overhead. Typically all the lines go out underground at a substation and then they come above ground or maybe they don't at all. They, they go down Nassau Street and Witherspoon Street underground. And there are two different systems there and, and somewhere between 6 and 12 individual circuits with, uh, with circuit breakers. Now, um, <clears throat> this equipment runs millions of watts through it and anything that has millions of watts through it has one philosophy, when, when in doubt, explode. Um, so I, I, just, I just thought it was useful. That there are two problems in dealing with uh, moving a substation. One is that the whole topology converges on that one spot. And that means enormous amount of digging. And uh, uh, I, th I think I, I don't want to try to give an estimate, except that I've heard numbers like $20 million uh, just on the topological issues. The, the other possibility is you don't change the topology enough, but you put the station underground and then build things above it. Well, here is a, a transformer that is uh, of similar size to the ones we have uh, on Wigan Street. And uh, why, don't, why don't we play the uh, picture again, Peter? Do you want to do that? Uh, we're gonna, yeah, there it goes. Oh, good. Fourth of July. This is the transformer right here. We have a, a, an arc. Overheated the transformer, the oil is coming out, and of course we have a nice spark to ignite it. And uh, I don't think I want to be above that when that happened. Um, play the um, the other one on the left there. Well, I'll play one other picture of what can happen here. Um, Here's another uh, technical, uh, well that, that one we survived, but I wouldn't want to be above that one either. What, what happened there? What happened there was that they opened a disconnect <laughs> switch, not a circuit breaker, and, and the line was charged. So uh, that is not a full, uh, run the, uh, the other one isn't charged either, but run, run that other one if you will. Yeah, that one right there. <coughs> power lines, many of which were, I believe, installed to generate uh, power for the hospital technological facilities. It, this could be an opportunity for us to include uh, suggestions about what we might do about that issue because it's affecting the landscape. East didn't use to catch fire because they were... Oh, sorry. Can I just ask you a very, very quick question about the power station? 
Um, in, a, in, in New York and in big cities, uh, down the South Street, Seaport, whatever, I've seen transformers that have been, instead of burying it, instead of getting rid of it, because the cost is very prohibitive. Why don't you just kind of create a simple structure that won't cost that much money, like a little house or something, that wraps around it? And so you get away from the, the aesthetic, is the important thing, really, that you basically create a screen that, um, okay, when you get up close, it looks like a screen, but from a distance, it at least looks like part of the streetscape. And I, I just wonder whether you would invest. I, I, I didn't have the benefit of coming to your Saturday meetings, and I just wonder whether anybody's investing in Well, the, the, the issue goes beyond that, I think, but includes that, as, and, and that could be a suggestion. I think the interesting thing is, it is part of our environment, including the substation, and all the wires, and all the lines, and all the poles, that we have become totally they have become totally invisible to us. Um, so Sheldon pointed out when I actually made drawings of the churches on Witherspoon Street, I left out the poles and it looked like a different universe uh, because the pole in front of the churches is generally taller than the steeple of the church. Uh, so this might be an issue from the substation and maybe Arch can help us figure out the topology as he calls it, of the service that's required in this neighborhood because it's certainly is a time that if the hospital moves, in which we might re-examine the whole system, um, part of which could include a disguised approach. The other is would be would we be able to use the land in another way? Um, I, I might want to say, by the way, the transformers like that didn't used to catch fire like that. They're full of flammable um, oil uh, at this point, uh, vegetable oil, mineral oil, whatever. They used to be full of polycarbonated biphenyls, which will not burn, even with those big sparks. Um, of course, those are a major pollutant, so we got rid of all that, and now we put flammable oil in these things. So. Remember that our, our motto here is, uh, come here and talk about it before you explode. <laughs> well, thank you all for coming. Our next meeting is March. Our next meeting, <laughs> March what? March 5th. March 5th. That is a Saturday morning, 9 a.m. But we hope you're up to make it. <laughs>